Bush with uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel and uh, Jose Manuel uh, Barroso, the president of the EC, is during part of the uh, annual U.S.-EU summit at the White House this year, uh, discussing a uh, number of the issues. The, the presidency of the EU itself rotates on an a uh, uh, annual basis. It, uh, Angela Merkel inheriting this now from Tony Blair, who, of course, is the uh, head of, the, uh, of Great Britain. Joining us with some thoughts, and we only have time to kind of do high altitude thoughts on the relations between the EU and the U.S. right now. Sally McNamara is with the Heritage Foundation, and Jonathan Jacoby is with the Center for American Progress. And I thank you both for hanging around and listening to the news conference and uh, waiting to see what came out of this as well. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Sally, uh, how would you characterize relations now between the U.S. and EU? Obviously damaged for a time uh, over the Iraq war issue. Are we making progress on mending that on a number of fronts, trade, environment, and so forth? Well, it's no secret that um, President Bush gets on with Chancellor Merkel very well, and this seems to be a lot of smiles and a lot of uh, happy hugs all around. In terms of getting to the nitty-gritty of the policy issues, we've seen the priority of economic issues because they're the least controversial, if you like. Climate change, it would sound as if the Europeans have done a Damascene conversion here. However, what we will see at the G8 and at the Bali conference in December is that Europe is still very wedded to this idea of having a Kyoto-style treaty, even though the first one abjectly failed. In terms of the big foreign policy questions, America and Europe still have very, very different approaches on how we deal with it right. and uh, the deep questions like that. And, and if Jonathan were to, to judge the importance of issues based on airtime during the news conference, it's tough to do because they were across the board uh, focusing so much on environment, trade, politics, and so forth. What do you believe is the greatest area for, for uh, potential? growth in the relationship here. Sure. Well, the, the reason it hit on so many issues was because the European Union has been able to assert its agenda, especially in the wake of the Iraq war when the U.S. has lost some credibility around the world and the Europeans have been able to put forward climate change as a high priority, uh, international development as a high priority. Uh, the Darfur issue is one that unites, of course, the U.S. and Europe, and it's just a question of whether there's the political will for the president to continue to push on it. Right. But you do see that there's you know, a, a tremendous amount of cooperation, at least in terms of certain aspects of climate change that would not have happened a year ago. So we finally see the president pulling his head out of the sand and seeing that climate change does happen, that it's a man-made contribution to a problem that will threaten the planet. I would definitely disagree. I would definitely disagree. The words and the language that was coming out here was very similar to what was said at the 2005 Glen Eagle Summit with the G8. And President Bush admitted that there was a problem and we've got to deal with it. It's just that we have a different policy approach between the Americans and the Europeans. I don't think President Bush ever had his head in the sun. I, I think I, the Europeans were unwilling to move forward, but with the abject, embarrassing failure of the first Kyoto Treaty, they've admitted we've got to try different policy mixes here. Well, well, let me ask you both on, on the trade issue, since we were covering business here at CNBC. Sure. That's, that's near and dear to our heart, and the Doha round has just been stalled forever. Can, can we see any signs? that maybe this could be jump-started at some point. Jonathan? Sure. Well, the, I mean, the European Union and the U.S. seem to have worked out an arrangement on standards. So they're trying to harmonize their standards. But the much larger global picture in trying to develop the WTO uh, global talks and take it to a successful conclusion, it does to be now uh, finally on the president's desk to it will need political leadership sustained from him and from his EU counterparts. But it's the developing world that has really put this on the agenda because th this is the Doha development round. Right. The idea is to incorporate their concerns about, uh, you know, there are 6.5 billion people on the planet. 5.5 billion of those folks live in the developing world, and they've finally been able to push their agenda through to address the problems of agricultural subsidies, for example, in the United States. And it's encouraging that President Bush is saying that he will push hard to address and reduce those subsidies and hopefully reinvest them in some ways in renewable crops, which is renewable energy crops, which is really where this points and connects to climate change. Sally, what's your assessment? The biggest, the biggest problem stalling Doha at the moment is Europe's enormous agricultural subsidies. There is no doubt that America has some agricultural subsidies, but Europe's subsidies are about three times higher than those of the United States. And Mandelson has not been able to deliver the French um, relief from the common agricultural policy. If we look at the developing world, one of the most harmful public policies against African farmers is the common agricultural policy. I think it's going to be much harder for the EU to deliver them to the table than for President Bush to deliver a package that we can sign.
All right. Thank you both for your time. And again, thank you for sticking around during the news conference as well. Jonathan Jacoby of uh, Center for American Progress and Sally McMarin from the Heritage Foundation. Thank, thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. While we were in this